Welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast, a podcast from the home of Scrum. In this podcast, we feature professional Scrum trainers and other Scrum practitioners sharing their stories and experiences to help learn from the experience of others. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Ripley with Agile for Humans and professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. I'm stepping in as a guest host for episodes highlighting the experiences of other Scrum.org professional scrum trainers. I hope you enjoy getting to know these amazing people. All right, welcome to another episode of Becoming a Scrum Master. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me today, fellow professional scrum trainer, Andre, how are you? It's great to see you. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm doing great. I woke up today. I'm very happy. So I'm, I'm easy to please. If I wake up and get another day, I'm grateful. So as a Ukrainian, I understand that. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. I think we'll jump right into it. Uh, sure. And so this is about becoming a scrum master. So let's start at the beginning. So can you share the story of how you first encountered scrum and what motivated you to become a scrum master? And if there was a particular moment or experience that really sparked your interest in scrum? So. I will share the story, but please promise me not to do the same because <laughs> the way how I became the Scrum Master is not is not the very good one. So originally, I suggest people and I recommend people that the best way to become a Scrum Master is to actually grow into a Scrum Master from the developer accountability as we have in Scrum because this is the best. So typically, we apply Scrum in software uh, in software development, developing uh, software products and the best way for you to get started is actually to have the technical knowledge to really help your team to deliver value within the sprint. But the way how I became a Scrum Master, I was, I can honestly say that I was a 20 year old kid, 20 year old kid by the time I was still a student. I was still in the university. I was in my fourth year in the university and I started working in a small company. It was like an outsource company and it was 2014. If I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken, but or, uh, or 2015, and the war in Ukraine started uh, back, back back then. And the CEO of that company, uh, he had an idea of a new business of recruiting people from Ukraine and relocating them to Europe. So I started as a recruiter, and after three months working there, uh, I had to find a scrum master to fill a position. And I started reading into Scrum Guide, into what, who, who is Scrum Master, because I had really no idea. And as soon as I started reading the Scrum Guide and started reading the articles at Scrum.org blog, uh, I made a very, very interesting like neural connection because uh, I used to play basketball professionally back when I was in Ukraine. And to me, a really cool Scrum Master sounded like a really cool point guard in basketball and that's how I became interested in scrum and I, I used to play the point guard position so it was it was pretty natural to me and I was just I started researching that sounded like something super cool and I just went up to the CEO uh, after we filled the position and said look we have a software house we're doing a lot of stuff so maybe we can try scrum over there and this is how I became scrum master but the reason nice. I don't recommend that because I became a Scrum Master with literally zero knowledge and zero understanding about what was I doing. And this is a bad place to start because basically you're wasting company's money and you are getting educated by the costs of the company. And uh, sometimes... being, a Scrum Master, being a Scrum Master is a huge accountability. So for the first year of my career, I had no idea what I was doing, to be honest. Uh, I, what I, so I, I totally appreciate that you're you're recommending training and knowledge and and experience. I will say though that it is a very common thing to hear that the first scrum master role or first scrum master job came from somebody just stepping up and saying, "Hey, I'll do it." And then so I think I think that's awesome. It's either it's either brave or foolish. And sometimes those two look the same, right? <laughs> so I mentioned I was 20 years old, so it was way less bravery. And... <laughs> but I don't regret it. 
I don't regret it. But the no. thing is that once you become a scrum master, okay, you became a scrum master. Now it's your responsibility to become to to look how how great you can be as a scrum master. And basically, you have to work your butt off to really be a good scrum master. And this is what I've been doing. That's so awesome. I, I had a motto at the beginning of my career that, yeah, you might be better than me, but you will never outwork me. So basically keeping that's, that. That's, that's the way to be. If you, if they they might be better, but they'll never never outwork you. And um, I, I think uh, the workers end up winning. So that's a great story. I appreciate you sharing it. Was there a specific project or situation where you had an, a eureka moment or a light bulb moment that really showed you the true power and potential of Scrum? And if so, could you describe that? To be honest, those Eureka moments, they still keep happening. Mm. Because as soon as you work, you learn something new all the time. And I remember the first moment when we had like a really nice sprint with the shift sprint goal, and it just, you know, things clicked. And it was really awesome. But the more you work as a Scrum Master, for example, for me, and this is one of the things I'm fighting with, uh, that the more I work as a Scrum Master, the less I'm capable to celebrate small victories and small successes, and they are very important. So mm -hmm. for now, for example, those eureka moments, they still keep, keep happening, for example, at the Pandadoc, where I'm currently working. But those things, they they keep happening not only just on one team level, but they keep, they keep happening on the org level, like on the org design level, or for example, the goals that we set up for ourselves. So uh, the last really eureka moment I had, uh, I don't know how much details I can share, but we were working on the part of the product with four teams. And you know, this feeling when you have four teams of re really awesome teams and you don't have to do much over there because they already educated and they, they know how, how to work uh, together. But just to see that magic between four teams working together collaboratively, uh, collaboratively on one thing and not just working uh, with individual code, but with shared code co code ownership, it's it's really dope, dope thing to see. And this actually made my December, to be honest, because work related this was really 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 cool that's awesome that's I hope great i to answered hear. the question <laughs> no you did great i think it's 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 a great answer where the eureka moments still happen right you still see how scrum can impact lives and drive good outcomes and and help teams be successful i think that's it's we get cynical right it's like oh it's the same old thing and i love the fact that you're still like excited about those moments i think that's great Thank you. So, so the key here is that you have to practice what you preach. You really have to practice it because when you're out of practice, or you don't see like, like the practical context for, for a while, you get lost in it and the world moves just too fast right now. Yep. No, I think that's a great perspective. And that kind of moves us into our next uh, question here. You know, how has your perception and execution of the scrum master role or accountabilities evolved? And are there aspects of the accountabilities that you view differently uh, now compared to when you first started? So that's, an, that's a really cool question. So I'm going to start with the second part, right? So when I just started, I believe that Scrum as a job is to make sure that our Scrum works, right? And this is it. We have Scrum on a team level. It works. Then my job is done here. I can move on. Sure. So right now, I look at the accountability of the Scrum Master as if Scrum Master is accountable to help the company to achieve its goals with Scrum implementation. And this is a very different perspective for me because then it means that my job lies into two like main directions. Direction number one is that it's change management, right? Because when we implement Scrum, it means that we don't adapt Scrum to the way the company works, but we change the way company works to actually use Scrum properly, right? And this is a huge change, change management. But second part, it's not like just process management, but it's operational management. If we compare product owner to the CEO of the company, I think we should be comparing Scrum Master to the COO of the company. And 
this is how I view the scrum as accountability right now, that this person has to really, really, really be a very senior. This person has to know a lot about org design and org development. This person has to know a lot about the domain you're working in. This person has to know a lot about operations management, about change management, about all of the other techniques that might be helpful to you, like engineering techniques, process-related techniques, and stuff like that. And coming to the first part of the question is how... Um, how the how the understanding of the accountability changed the perception and the execution is that even when we run the class PSM2, right, or advanced professional scrum master, we have those uh, not desired stances of a scrum master. So basically, I got I'm trying to get rid of all of those negative stances, but before doing something or changing something or pointing something out, I think always right now okay so operationally even if we change that what would be the impact for the company and will we earn more will we lose something because if we change it means that for some period uh, for some period of time we're less productive than we are and basically right now before doing anything i'm thinking about like the impact it's gonna give and it made me like it made me more into an impact driven scrum master so for example if i see a problem but the cost of fixing the problem is too big and potential gain from fixing the problem uh, is too small, it means that the problem isn't that impactful, so maybe it's not the time to fix it right now. For example. So this uh, is, I, I don't know whether it makes sense. <laughs> oh, it, it makes great sense. It's that, yeah. you know, that, that careful evolution and change and, and how you show up and, and perform the role. So, or, or fulfill the accountabilities as we, as we say now. So. As we have to say, right? <laughs> I have to say it or else, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what advice would you give to someone aspiring to become a scrum master? Is there a particular mindset, skill, or habit that you believe is crucial for success in this role or to fulfill the accountabilities? I believe that for the beginning, even, so I think the first question you need to answer to yourself is do you really understand that accountability and everything it takes to be good at that because this is the first thing because if the answer is no then you have to research and after the research you have to answer that nasty second question do you have what what it takes to become a really 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 good scrum master and i don't mean to discourage everybody it's just some something like personal to me because when i starting doing something i want to be really really good at it yep. right if you enter the accountability of a Scrum Master without the desire to be good at it, I understand why you might do that, but I don't see like a very bright future ahead because we can see how market is going right now, right? With layoffs and stuff like that. So uh, I believe in brutal truth here. <laughs> yeah, so, so to me, the first uh, thing you have to answer to yourself is do you really understand the accountability? And do you really want that and on the second part it's just like work 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 on yourself you yeah. you really have to work your butt off to be good at, to be a good scrum master because if you bring something to the organization and you ask the organization people inside to learn constantly and to constantly improve you have to be the true reflection of that uh, wonderful an example wonderful advice um it's not an entry-level job not at all. Yep. Don't don't try to repeat the same uh, way I got into it. <laughs> yep. uh, what is the one book every Scrum Master should read? One. You can only pick one. Does not have to be an Agile book. This is the question we leave everybody with. Just the, the one book that you think would have a great impact. Doesn't have to be Agile. Doesn't have to be Scrum. Just the book you think I'd we ought to read. I'd say so. So I will omit all of the white papers and the scientific papers I read. So I'm going to recommend Fifth Discipline of Peter Sanj. The Fifth Very Discipline. Good. The Art of Building Learning organ Organizations. Yep. Somehow it's still not that popular among Scrum Master and it's, it frustrates me. <laughs> Should be. It's a great book. Should be. It's, it's an awesome book. We'll put a link in the chat or in the... Uh in the chat as well, but in the show notes, in the description, we'll make sure people can see that. So Andre, anything you want to get in front of the listeners and the viewers before we 
uh, wrap this up. And how can they get a hold of you if they want to learn more about you and, and the things that you do in the community? Oh, so you can reach out to me by LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm fine with that. I'm open. So if you have any questions or anything I can help you with, uh, please do. On the more important note, uh, if we ha still have some time, because reaching out to me isn't that important. The more important thing is to support Ukraine. I'm a Ukrainian, and please continue supporting Ukraine. Yep. This, we'll have... this would be like the most yeah. impactful thing to do. That, that's a that's a great message. I think that's even the message of your sweatshirt, right? Oh, it's it's a play of words, but if to translate it like, what does it mean? It means like the spirit out of iron. Okay, very cool. Yeah. We'll make sure to get some links in the description on um, how to support and how to help uh, everything going on in the Ukraine um, in Ukraine. And Andre has been a big force behind that. And uh, Todd and I have participated. We'll continue to participate as however you invite us to do so. We're more than happy to. Um, but I really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate all the your heart for this and your heart for the uh, the people of Ukraine. And it's just great to be able to talk to you. And thanks for making time for us. Thank you very much for inviting me and having me. And thank you very much for, for the help, because uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ryan and Todd, they were participating. They were doing free workshop and they don donated themselves. So thank great. you very much, folks, for that. Uh, happy to do it.